Jen Browning. I'm Jen Browning, and I'm here with Kimberly Nofke to talk about warm season pest solutions for greenhouses and nurseries. I'm going to turn off my video so that we don't have bandwidth problems, um, and you'll be able to hear my voice, and you'll see me again at the end of the meeting. Hola y bienvenidos a la talla virtual de Ventigras. Soy Jen Browning, y estoy aquí con Kimberly Nofke para hablar de temporada Salida sus soluciones para plagas de plantas y envenaderos y afuero con la insecticida vendigra. First, a little bit about our captioning today. You're going to see a multimedia viewer box under the Q&A box. You'll get a warning about an external website. Go ahead and click continue on that for live captions and translation. The captions will display in the multimedia viewer panel. Click language to switch to Spanish in this panel. Pose el baton de language para cambiar el español. Let's get started with our technical program for today. You're all muted. I know that's a little bit difficult, but that does help with external noise so that we can all hear. But the Q&A box is open, so go ahead and put your questions in there. Anytime you think of them, we'll be answering those at the end and we'll address any technical difficulties that you have along the way in the Q&A box. Today's webinar is closed captioned in English and in Spanish, so you'll hear me speaking a little differently today. I'll be saying all the content you see on the screen so the captioner can pick that up for translation. Today's deck will also be available in PDF via email after the webinar, and all the resources and tools we talk about will be sent to you afterwards if you shared your email with us. There'll also be a survey that pops up at the end today to ask you about the content and the captioning. So let's talk piercing and sucking pests. As we head into the warmer months of the year, our pest pressures are going to start to shift and increase. So we're dealing with aphids, white flies, mealybug, and scale insects, among others. Today we'll focus on these four that make up the piercing and sucking group. If you're wondering why we don't include thrips in this group, it's because they're in a different order of insects and they're actually not very closely related. They're in what we call the piercing and rasping group. So the situation with the piercing and sucking insect group in summer is that as the season changes, the pests start to shift. The temperatures increase and because the insect development and populations are closely tied to temperature, their populations increase quickly in response. So first, the aphid species we're dealing with shift to harder to control species like black bean aphids, foxglove aphids, and other larger bodied, more hardy aphids. So later in the season, aphids are also going to start to produce winged males, and they have some sexual reproduction, which they don't do in the spring. With summer, white fly populations really get going and they start to build, and this is also the time of year that mealybug and scale insects get going. So the eggs become crawlers. The crawlers mature very quickly in climbing temperatures, turning into later instars, or what I like to call teenagers. The teenagers are more difficult to control. While oil applications are excellent at killing adults and really any stage of mealybug and scale insects and whitefly and aphids, oils are more difficult to use safely in high temperatures and humidity. You see another challenge in the photo on the left. Ants will come in and they'll ranch piercing and sucking insect pests, especially aphids, mealybug, and scale, and they protect them from natural enemies, which helps their populations build. So this means we have to have a plan in place to deal with all the strategies the pests have evolved to survive and to thrive in summer, because this is really their season to surge. So let's talk about strategy. It starts with programs and chemistry, choosing the best products and the timing, the applications, and the activities to your production cycle. But there's also some application techniques that you can use that will make a real difference in how well the products you choose work and also affect your bottom line. We'll talk about some useful resources that make product selection and pest identification a little easier. And then we'll finish up with you, what's bugging you in the can yard and the landscape. And if you have any questions, Put those in the chat as you think of them or bring them up at the end and let's talk about what you're dealing with. So when we think about product selection, probably the first criteria is efficacy. What's going to be the best tool for your pest? But of course, you have a lot more to weigh after that question is answered. You have to consider plant safety. We already mentioned that oil is a great tool for mealybug and scale, 
but it's not so great for the dead of summer. And you might have concerns about particular formulations, and we'll talk about that. The spectrum or the number of pests that the product controls, you're rarely battling just one insect at a time. So you'll be looking at products that can do a number of different jobs for you. When it comes to the group four, neonics and their relatives, you're going to be taking into account if your operation can even use those or if you've kind of taken those out of the puzzle. And if you can use them, do you use them early or can you use them all season? Do you use them only indoors? Do you use them not at all? You might be thinking about whether or not you're using targeted materials because you're trying to manage biologicals and you have to be taking compatibility into consideration. Are you trying to preserve pollinators and therefore maybe you're avoiding all broad spectrum materials? And so much of this depends on what your customer wants and demands. Finally, price and application method are important too. So this really isn't a very simple task at all. We've created some tools to try to make this a little bit more simple. So what this table is, is aphid rotation products, and it's split into two different groups. Above the orange line are products that you might look at if you're making a foliar only type of approach, meaning you don't start with group fours, the neonics, you don't do those drench applications. Below the line is a program that you could look at if you were starting with group fours, so you drench systemic, but you can move back and forth between these groups and pick products from anywhere in the list. You can use them in any order. The list shows you which products work best on aphids overall, and it gives you their mode of action, the rate range, timings, and some other notes that might help, like which ones stop feeding or which ones control all life stages. So for example, at the top of the list, you could start with Ventigra. That's gonna give you control of all life stages, translaminar and contact activity. And in that top group, you have other options like Altus, which also gives you systemic and translaminar protection. You've got Mainspring, which is locally systemic. You've got Azotin, which is a inhibitor of um, reproduction and development, so it acts sort of as a light IGR as well as an insecticide. You've got Aria, which is another feeding suppressant. And then you've got Talstar. You move down below the line and you look at systems where you start with that systemic drench like Marathon, that controls all life stages. You can rotate in Ventigra for more life stage protection across all the life stages. And then you also have an option there for an alternative to group four drenches, and that's Contos. You should also include an IGR like Distance, and then you could also look at something like Hachi Hachi, which gives you contact activity. If you used Hachi Hachi in the distant past and you had some issues with it with plant safety, you should know it's been reformulated in recent years. It's a really excellent material and it's got a better plant safety profile than it had in the past. Might be worth another look. Here's the same type of a guide for whitefly. So this is the same approach. You've got foliar above the orange line, but if you start with a systemic drench, you can look below the line. Again, you see starting with Ventigra, you can control your adults, your eggs, and your early instar nymphs of whiteflies. And then you can rotate with products like Savat and get systemic alternative to group four. You can include Altus. You can include Talus, which is an IGR we'll talk more about a little bit later. You've got Azotin in there, which also gives you some IGR activity, and Talstar. Then you look at the systemic approach, starting with a drench of something like Marathon, or maybe you want to use Safari. You've got an alternative there of Contos, Rotate in Ventigra, Distance as your IGR, and Sand Mite. So you have some options for Wi-Fi. Finally, this is the similar table looking at Mealybug and Scale. So one difference to be aware of with Mealybug versus Scale is your choice of insect growth regulator. And we'll revisit this more in detail in a bit. For these pests, dormant applications of oil are invaluable to reducing your adult population and reducing the number of adults you have will reduce your pressure in season. So every reproductive adult you take out of the population is gonna significantly reduce the number of individuals you have down the road. Ultra Pure Oil from BASF is a highly refined, cleaner oil than you'll find in most other brands. So you will have enhanced plant safety with this product. Generally safe up to 85 degrees Fahrenheit and 85% humidity. Make your oil applications first in the spring to reduce your population of adults. I also recommend that you use oils in fall. In fact, anytime the weather permits and you know you have mealybug and scale pressure, treat with oil. You can't go wrong with oil when the weather permits. 
because it controls all life stages. It's a great resistance management tool, and it's also going to offer you leaf shine, and it removes hard water spots if you're in an area where you get buildup from hard water. You want to watch out if you're growing a blue-leafed crop like spruce, though, because it will take that bluing off. Once you move into the warmer, more humid months like now, you'll want to move to chemistries. So if you can do systemic group four drenches, those are great for mealybug and scale. Or if you rotate with other materials, you can have a full program for those pests. If you have high pressure or certain kinds of scale, you may need special strategies for this group. And we'll touch on that when we get to the IGR specifically. For this pest group, though you get a rate range on this table, I suggest you always go with the high rates if you have even moderate pressure because they can be very hard to control and they can build up big populations very quickly. Ventigra is in the table for all the pests we've talked about and these are the rates for those pests. That aphid rate is typically going to be your spring aphid rate, your green peach aphid, your low to moderate pressure aphid rate. You don't need an adjuvant, just 1.4 ounces in good spray coverage. For whitefly, mealybug, and scale, you move up to 4.8 to 7 ounces and you add the plant safe adjuvant of your choice. Moving into the summer months and those difficult to control species of aphid that we talked about, and the higher pressure now with whitefly, mealybug, and scale, here's the easy go to rate. 4.8 or 5 ounces plus the adjuvant of your choice. If you don't already have a go-to adjuvant, for reference, we use capsule in our trials. For your distributor rep, we'll also make a recommendation for your area and for your crop. Again, if you have high pressure or you're dealing with mealybug and scale in summer, the 7 ounce rate is a better approach since higher temperatures are going to speed up development and populations. It's a lot easier to stay clean than it is to get clean after the fact, which is why some growers only use high rates across the board regardless of pressure. That's your call. I mentioned we talk more in depth about insect growth regulators. Definitely include them in your rotation. These don't just prevent the adults and unwanted children from happening. They'll also kill juveniles and they'll reduce your populations of scale right now. So as you see in bullet number two, they can kill up to 85% of your juveniles right now. They're specific to the pest and they work best when they're applied with plant safe adjuvant of your choice. Check the label for which ones work best with an adjuvant, but here's the breakdown on the products. So distance is a new farm product and an EC formulation of pure proxifen. It's excellent on scale and it will also pick up aphids and Western flower thrips. Fulcrum is a water-based formulation of the same active ingredient from OHP. Talus is a different active ingredient. It's bupropizin, and it's excellent on mealybug, and this material will also give you activity on leafhopper and psyllids. So keeping in mind whatever pests you're dealing with, you'll want to pick the insect growth regulator that's going to give you activity on those pests and is also going to um, interrupt the life cycle of those pests during the season. It's really important to use an insect growth regulator. It can make such a difference in your pest pressure. If you're dealing with a lot of scale at this time of year, choose distance or fulcrum. Those are gonna be the best for you on scale. So you know what to do and when to do it in terms of your crop, of course, you know when to pinch, you know when to transplant. When should you worry about all of these chemical decisions now? So plan your program before your summer crop is crawling with mealybugs, before the white flies are moving in crowds over your hibiscus. When you start a new crop, you already know what insects are likely to come. You might have been gifted with some of them in your propagation material, like if you buy poinsettia cuttings, they often come with white flies. Pick your products when you start your crop. So oils early if you can, and then choose two to five modes of action and include an IGR in there. Plus have a broad spectrum rescue in mind in case you need to clean up everything quickly. During your production cycle, run your program rotating these chemistries that you choose and make any biologicals releases and applications that you have planned. During this time, focus on getting the most from your program by getting great spray coverage, and we'll talk about that in just a minute. During the cycle, scout often, monitor your cards, your traps, your leaf count so you can make adjustments on the fly. If you do end up with a big spike in pressure, increase your rates or shorten your spray intervals or tank mix products if you need better control. And make notes for the next crop cycle so you can fine tune your program for the coming seasons. 
One thing we know about programs that work really well is that the grower anticipated trouble. So a great way to know that you're going to have whiteflies is if you're growing one of the whitefly magnets. So that would be poinsettia, hibiscus, gardenia, and mandevilla. Or if you're from Southern California like I am, mandevilla. So the best recommendation is to make your program proactive and plan for trouble. The goal is to not have to make any insecticide applications after color up and flower set with poinsettia specifically. So how do you do that? Well, you're going to want to choose great chemistry now from sticking through vegetative. And if you can, start with that systemic drench. So with poinsettia, you're not going to have a lot of bee visits, and it might be a little bit easier to start with that systemic drench. With that crop in particular, it might be a little more difficult with some of the flowering crops like gardenia, including Ventigra, Mainspring, and one of the insect growth regulators like Distance or Fulcrum is a great way to do that. And that recommendation comes from research that was done by Stanton Gill and others and published in Grower Talks in 2019. Let me show you what they found. So in this trial, they looked at common insecticides that were used in poinsettia production, but this translates to all the different crops that get white flies. They found that Mainspring and Ventigra consistently performed better than other products tested in the efficacy trial against white flies, but the Altus population was still about 100 nymphs or more per two leaves. That is incredibly high pressure from the Altus treatment. So we recommend you take the best in show here and combine it to make an excellent program that sets you up to avoid rescue applications later in the season. Drench with systemic to start, rotate with Ventigra, Mainspring, and Insect Growth Regulator, and that will prevent you from having to make rescue applications as you're just getting ready to ship that finished crop. Of course, you spend a good amount of time up front um, attending webinars, learning about pests, choosing the right chemistry, and then we're going to spend a fair amount of time making the applications and getting good spray coverage and doing all of these things. So making that investment go all the way for us is going to make sure that we're successful, but also that we're spending our time wisely and our money wisely, particularly since what comes back in all of the surveys that go out to growers is that the thing that is the most difficult is labor. So trying to make the money go farther often does come down to spray coverage. So one thing that can help with spray coverage is adjuvants. They assist with contact materials, number one, and they also can assist you a lot with insect growth regulators. When you check the labels, not every product will tell you that you should use a spray adjuvant, but they'll often tell you that um, the product may be enhanced by using a spray adjuvant. So if you aren't sure if you need one, you can ask your distributor rep if they recommend one. They will often be a good source for information about whether or not a product is more efficacious with the additive of a spreader or a sticker and which one you should use if you're not sure. Make sure that when you're making spray applications, you're getting good coverage of the tops and bottoms of the leaves, the entire canopy of the plant, and also your bark if you're making bark applications. Um, using adjuvants in particular does help with the contact insecticides and miticides and the growth regulators, but the adjuvants won't do you any good if you don't get the material all over the plant. The other thing that you want to know is that with translaminar and systemic products, if you wait for a systemic to get all the way up through the vascular system of a plant, or you wait for a translaminar product to get through the leaf tissue, think of something like ligustrum, or even something like rhododendron or gardenia, and you think about material having to go all the way through thick leaves like that to come in contact with a pest that's on the underside of the leaf, you can be looking at two to seven days for control for that to come in contact with the insects that you're trying to make contact with. So spray coverage can really enhance control and make it happen a lot faster for you. Fourth, move that canopy. Use pressure and nozzles that get the leaves moving in the canopy to help get good coverage without having to painstakingly paint every leaf with the material. Something like a trident nozzle or a cone nozzle at a good water pressure will do that for you. Solid stream and flat fan nozzles take longer and they don't give you as good coverage on a single pass. 
A couple of notes that I wanted to share with you about warm weather and calibration from my own experience spraying in hot greenhouses. The first is that you wanna calibrate the humans. You wanna train staff or yourself to spray and walk at the right speed and make sure that their technique is matching the material that they're spraying. This is really important when it's hot and we wanna run through the greenhouse at full speed and be done with the task already because let's face it, in June, July, and August, it's pretty miserable and nobody wants to be wearing PPE and making spray applications. What we wanna be doing is uh, showing our teams how to calibrate and what good coverage looks like for the products that we're applying. So that might mean showing people what spray to runoff looks like versus spray to just before runoff because many labels will differentiate exactly how much material they want you to put out. So that is where a product that leaves residue can actually be helpful because the residue will act like a spray indicator. So if you go back in the day after you make an application and look for that residue, that can give you a good idea of whether or not you got good coverage. That last note on the bottom is helpful. Equip sprayers to take their time. When I was spraying in the greenhouses in Oregon, it's in the Willamette Valley where I was working and it's very hot there in the summer. It can get up to 100 degrees for about a month and it was very hot in the greenhouses. And we wore vests with ice packs in them to try to keep the spray team cool while we were spraying. But the other thing that we did was we timed spray applications at night and we split the tasks to multiple people to try to spread out everybody being hot. And what that did was it just meant that everybody spent less time spraying so that hopefully we wouldn't rush through the task and we would get good spray coverage. These are small things that just help a little bit. It didn't make the task any more delightful, of course, but it did make sure that we did get good coverage and we weren't rushing through and skipping steps or skipping areas and also that we finish the job safely and thoroughly. And that goes along with equipment calibration and making sure that you do move that canopy and try different nozzles, replace them on a regular basis and use those adjuvants to help with the job of spreading and sticking. When we think about all the different ways that we make decisions and are choosing to manage those summer pests, we have kind of a lot on our plate, right? So choosing the products that we're going to deploy, we have a lot more chemistry available to us than we had in the past. The summer pests are going to be really tough for us. You are gonna to have to bring your A game. So if you're running biologicals, one of the things that you're probably familiar with is that it's a harder thing to manage in the summer. The thing to be aware of is that the pests are going to increase um, exponentially in July and August. It's gonna be difficult to keep ahead of them even with chemistry and you make more releases of biologicals and they just don't work as well during the hotter times of the year. And that's not a fault of yours or a fault of the biologicals. That is just nature and hot temperatures. So choosing the best chemistry that works for your programs and pest pressure will be key. And if you do it before the pressure is high, do it now before it is the peak of the season and the temperatures are very high. That gives you some time to refer to some of the resources that we're about to show you and make some thoughtful decisions about choosing chemistry that's compatible with your biologicals, for example, or choosing formulations that are gonna be the safest on the plants that you're growing, or choosing the IGR that's gonna be the best for the pests that you're trying to tackle, whether that's mealybugs or scale. Make sure that you are not skipping your insect growth regulators. I've talked to two or three growers this year who bought insect growth regulators in previous seasons and have not deployed them yet because they just were not convinced that it was gonna do enough work for them. So recently I had the opportunity to call JC Chong at Clemson University and ask about when he should deploy a distance or fulcrum or talus and how much did he think it was actually gonna make a difference in various scenarios. And he told me up to 85% kill on some of these insects, specifically mealybug and scale. So they really do make a difference. Make sure that you're including them in your programs. Include those adjuvants to get good coverage and move that canopy. It can make a huge difference in how well your insecticides work. Really an increase of about 50% in how well 
you get your efficacy that you're hoping for. And take advantage of the research and resources that make that decision making easier. You will receive a PDF of this deck and also the resources that Kimberly's about to tell you. Um, and they can really help you decide for yourself what is gonna work in your production system and what's gonna give you the most bang for your buck. So we talked about some program approaches and choosing some of the best products and timings, and you'll get those tables that let you kind of see what's gonna fit for you. We talked about some application techniques that will help you ensure success. Kimberly is gonna take over for just a minute here and share some information and some resources with you. And then I'll be back to talk to you about your questions. I see some that showed up in the chat and we'll address those in just a minute. Kimberly, I'm turning it over to you. Jen, before introducing the BASF team, I just wanted to touch on our collaboration with greenhouse and nursery growers. We know that you are innovators and always looking to improve operational efficiencies and learn about solutions and advancements. We listen to your challenges and work together to collaborate on solutions that help you to grow. Introducing our BASF team, at the top are our sales specialists by region, Karen Schmidt and Carissa Jones are our regional sales managers. Liz Dunbar is our new ornamentals marketing manager. And our tech team includes Jen Browning, who has been speaking with you this afternoon, Kyle Miller, and Dr. Emma Lukaba. We have some fantastic resources available to you, including our insect identification poster, as well as insect management guides that focus on specific pests and provide best management practices and rotations. In addition, our 2021 Grower Talks IMF Guide is another great resource that we are happy to provide to you. Please feel free to reach out to your distributor or BASF representative, and we would be happy to send these out to you right away. We are really looking forward to the Cultivate Trade Show and would love to see you at our booth number 1439. We will be featuring our newest innovation, Avalio fungicide, and we hope that you can also join us for an informational webinar on July 22nd at 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. We'll now address any questions that were submitted. Jen, I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you very much. So we had one question about drench failures and aphids. What are the reasons for a drench to fail, especially for aphids? Yeah, oh, that's a really good question. So one of the reasons that you can get failure on drench is if you make the application and you go back and look for efficacy maybe two days later. It takes that drench material a while to move into the root zone and then come up into the top of the plant, especially if you drenched and did not go over the top of the plant, right? So sometimes you drench and you've done a canopy over the top, so you did treat the top of the plant at the same time that you drenched, but sometimes you did a directed drench, so you only treated the roots and then you have to wait for that material to get into the plant go up the vascular system and come up to the top of the plant. And that can be, oh, that's that two to seven days that we talked about, right? So it could be a week later before you see those aphids fall off. That's reason one. Here's reason two. If you have a really high population of aphids, sometimes what you'll see them do is they'll stack up like a pyramid. And so you'll see one layer of aphids that are coming in contact with the plant, and then you'll see all their daughters and their granddaughters are standing on their backs. So the aphids that are coming in contact with the plant is only one level, and then you've got a whole bunch of other ones standing on top of each other. And it takes them longer to come in contact with the plant that's been treated with insecticide. And so you keep going back looking for efficacy and to see those aphids fall off. Now keep in mind, in the spring and early summer, they're all female and they're all reproducing, or as Suzanne Wainwright would call them, baby cannons. So you're killing them, but at the same time, they're shooting out more babies all the time. And since they're pyramiding up like that, sitting on top of each other, you're always gonna see new live aphids. 
And that's the reason I think sometimes you'll go back and think, why are they not all dying? It's because they are just reproducing so fast and they're not all coming in contact. That's where sometimes a drench can be less, uh, give you a little bit less bang for your buck and sometimes a contact over the top can work better or you could do both to reduce your populations right off the bat. So I think that really can make sort of a difference for you. One of the other questions that we got was, can I tank mix the IGR with the insecticides? That's a good question. Uh, we had a grower ask about that, doing that specific thing, and JC Chong's recommendation from Clemson was actually to alternate them. You don't need to do that, particularly if any of the products that you're using are an EC formulation. Go ahead and separate them out, particularly because it's summer, just for plant safety reasons, don't tank mix them. You don't need to do that. Go ahead and alternate them and rotate, separate them out. One of the other questions was, I haven't used any of the specific IGRs mentioned before, but I do use Azotin, which was in the table as an IGR. Is that enough? Um, Azotin does give you some insect growth regulation, but not to the same degree that pyroproxifen, which is in distance, and fulcrum or bupropizin, which is in talus, does. So I would recommend still including a specific IGR and still use the azotin because azotin is also a really good product. I'd use both, particularly if you're dealing with um, mealybug and scale, which I feel like need, <laughs> need a number of different modes of action and a number of different chemistries. Uh, one last question was, what are the special situations with scale? So the special situations with scale is that scale have a number of different strategies. Um, some scale are soft and look like mealybug, and then there are some armored or hard scale. And in the hard scale group, some have their eggs and their juveniles underneath the female. And so the crawlers are not very accessible. Even if you sprayed with a hort oil, for example, you might not get the crawlers because they're protected by the female, they're underneath her body. So that armored scale, even if you spray with an oil, you're not gonna get the crawlers because they're protected by her even if she's dead. And so that is a special situation where I recommend if you have a scale that you don't have a good ID on, you don't know exactly what that scale is, send it out and get an identification. That's a good recommendation for any insect pest you're dealing with. Send it to extension or call your BASF rep and let us help you get an identification from a university so we know exactly what you're dealing with. That also helps make sure you're using the right insecticide and the right insect growth regulator for the pests that you have. I'm just looking at the chat and I think that those are all of the questions that we had, unless there are any others, I think that wraps us up. Thank you so much for being with us today. I really appreciate all of you being here. Do we have any other? We, yeah. We do have one more question. Um, have if it. we have an existing scheme, Okay, if we have an existing scale population, how often should we spray drench to treat for them during these warm summer months? Yeah, if you have an existing scale population, so you've mentioned drench, which makes me think you are using systemics, and if you're using group fours, um, I would go ahead and, and start with that. Go ahead and do that now, and then give yourself a couple of weeks and do an IGR, use uh, distance or fulcrum, and then um, see where you are. Kind of take stock and see how things look. Go out and take a look at your scale, run your fingernail through them and see if they're alive. If they're squishy and juicy, they're alive. If they're dry, they're dead. Um, and if you still have population, then you might need to make another application. You could use Ventigra, you could use Safari, you could make another IGR application. Again, what is your species? That's gonna be an important part of how you manage those for the rest of the summer. And then don't forget in fall, as soon as your temperatures drop below 85 Fahrenheit and below 85% humidity, make yourself an oil application. Make a good decision in the fall that will help you next year. It's gonna really reduce your population in the coming seasons.
Wonderful. I'll Thank you, Jen. Contact info um, is up as well if anybody wants to follow up with any questions, if you have a specific scenario you wanted to discuss. Great. Thank you again and great questions. Uh, we hope that you enjoyed the event today and found the content interesting and helpful. Within the next 24 hours, you will be receiving a PDF version of the presentation that we shared today via email. Um, also, you will see a quick survey pop up once this webinar ends. We would appreciate any feedback that you would like to share with us. Thank you again for your time and I hope you have a great afternoon. Thanks everyone. Bye.